Hi guys, it is a cloudy, gloomy day here in the collapse of global industrial <laughs> civilization here on what is supposed to be the last day of winter, although it feels like summer here in the middle of March 2020, and this is Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles. But as you probably know, guys, we're doing a special series this week called Coronavirus Chronicles where I am interviewing a wide variety of folks that I have had on this program before. And I have the great pleasure of bringing on uh, journalist Robert Hunziker, probably best known for his regular columns in Counterpunch. And so, Robert, come on and say hi, and then I'm going to frame this uh, conversation and we're going to dive right into it. Okay, great, Sam. Uh, and hi to you and all of your people who listen into this. Um, and uh, when you sent me the email uh, asking for or suggesting some ideas and questions that you had, uh, I thought to myself, uh, uh, what I would want to hear somebody talk about in light of what's going on right now, because this is really, this virus is a massive wake-up call and it impacts every single person socially, politically, economically, financially. I happen to have a background. I have a, a master's degree in, in economic history, and I spent a number of years doing uh, pretty in-depth research uh, in the financial markets for some hedge funds. And then I've been a, 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 a freelance uh, uh, journalist and uh, environmental journalist for the last decade. And so uh, I do have familiarity with what's happening right now and a lot of the impact, because it's really impacting credit markets, financial markets, uh, that really stands out. So what I did is I put together five little kind of vignettes, if you will. Uh, one's going to be the timelines of the virus vis-a-vis uh, -vis how it affects jobs, money, and the credit markets. Secondly, the second vignette will be an analysis of Federal Reserve's toolbox uh, how they handled the crisis in 2008, what they had in that toolbox then, what they have today to handle the one today, comparing those, that's really interesting stuff. The third vignette will be um, about the collapse of our sugar high stock market, and more specifically, the corporate debt bubble that's left in the rubble. And this is a serious, serious problem that the Fed is Sleep, they're experiencing sleepless nights over this one. We'll get into that in a little bit of detail. Fourth, uh, the deconstruction of our federal administrative state by the Trump administration. There's some things that need to be talked about there, I think. We're going to come back and harm people, and it's going to cause some tectonic changes, I believe. And fifth, there's been a breakdown of the world supply chain, and it goes right to the heart of 30 to 40 years of neoliberal capitalism's globalization and shipping uh, all of our manufacturing offshore to the cheapest available labor in the world, we're now paying the price. At any rate, uh, one of the things I think that's interesting right now is that we're witnessing the rise of capitalistic socialism. So maybe Bernie should be president, huh? The only thing is, Bernie's a democratic socialist, not a Republican socialist like the Republicans are today. Because what is socialism? It's government ownership, and the government's going to end up owning everything. As a matter of fact, they're going to throw so much money, the, all the central banks of the world are going to do this, that it's going to be like the biggest watermelon you've ever seen moving through a snake. And as it moves through the snake, it's going to impact various aspects of social life and economic life and political life. And on the back end of it, what comes out? Probably an explosion to the upside in stock markets. But that's way out in time. Meanwhile, we have to survive between now and then. Hopefully we do. So let's look at this um, number one item I talked about, which is the timeline for the virus and uh, how it affects our livelihoods, meaning our jobs, our money, credit markets. I talked to some people who study these things and know them pretty well. And here's what they said, two simple things. If this pandemic shows signs of peaking, within the next two to four weeks, then the credit markets will likely not collapse. Then we'll come through 
some kind of a ramp back up slowly like we did the 2008-2009 recessionary period where we come out of it alive and licking our wounds. However, if the pandemic is a long drawn out affair, the entire global financial system is probably going to collapse, freeze up, money will freeze up, liquidity will freeze up, and corporations will fall like dominoes. So we keep that in mind as we talk about these other vignettes I've got. But that's the time. Now, second item I want to talk about is the central bank. This applies to all central banks in the world, Bank of Japan, European Central Bank, U.S. Federal Reserve Bank. They have tools. They have a toolbox. They basically have two major tools to influence uh, a, a major catastrophe like we've got now. And that's what we've got right now. And what the Fed does, what happens when you have an inferno? You go out and you find the biggest fire hose you can find. That's what you do when you have an inferno. And that's what they're doing. But let's take a look at what happened in 2008-9, the Great Recession. What the tools were they had to work with then, compared to today, by the way. And you'll see that there's a problem brewing here. The federal funds rate, which is the rate the Fed charges for money, interest bank rate, the most sensitive of all, of all interest rates, which dictates all other interest rates, whether it's mortgages, credit cards, or whatever. It's where you start, federal funds. With 5% in 2007, before the 2008-2009 Great Recession, by 2009, that 5%, they chopped it down to almost zero. It was 0.16%. Where are we today? We're at 0% today. We're today where they ended up fighting the battle in 2009. We're not at 5%. They don't have any room. They shot that bullet. That big cannon's gone. So we can't count on that one. What about the federal balance sheet? That's the other tool they've got, where they actually go out and they'll buy bonds or buy all kinds of things and put them into the system and try to liquefy the system. The federal balance sheet in 2007 was about $870 billion. 2009, $2 trillion, 2015. And this is all the quantitative easing thing they did, $4.5 trillion to keep the economy moving ahead without falling into depression. If they had not done that, we would have gone into the, a bigger depression in 1930, by the way, if they had not done that. Today, where are we? We're where they finished in 2015. We're $4.4 trillion, and they just added a trillion five this last week to this banking network. So we're today at the end of where they were saving our asses in 2008 and 2009. We're not, the, the Fed toolbox has gotten spinning way down. We're out of bullets in a lot of ways. So what's gonna happen? Well, Ben Bernanke, who was the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board a few years ago, at one point in time made the suggestion that, well, helicopter money, if we ever had to, we could just drop helicopter money. That's $1,000 to $2,000 per, per, per family. They're going to start helicopter money. So that's coming next. This is that big fire hose I talked about. They're going to pour so much money into the system that my guess is they're going to rescue it. But along the way, um, there are going to be so many disasters along the way that it's going to be a bumpy ride coming out of it, I think. So that's where we are with the Fed. They're putting the government into a socialist enterprise, by the way, because they're going to be buying assets. They're going to be buying into the airlines, according to Trump. Now, if Bernie was president, would he buy to and support the airlines and casinos and cruise ships and the frackers, the oil and gas frackers? The answer is no, he wouldn't. He'd put it all into social programs and educational programs where we really need it. That's what he would do because isn't capitalism all about winning, losing, and failure if you don't do the right things? Well, bankruptcy is part of capitalism. Ask Donald Trump, he's had it six times. <laughs> My third, um, my third item I want to talk about is really a major, major risk here, and it has to do with the sugar high of the stock market we've had. And it's been on a sugar high for the last actual couple of years. The implications of that sugar high are absolutely deadly. Um, 
and it's the Fed's biggest worry, and that is the corporate debt bubble. And let me explain that. It's been mushrooming like you can't believe. Um, ever since the Great Recession in 2008, uh, corporations have been issuing 1.8 trillion, that's with a T, not a B, trillion, and new bond debt every year. And that's double the pace that they ever did before. Not only that, but they're up to their eyeballs in commercial loans to banks on top of this. Today, commercial loans to banks exceed mortgage loans. This has never happened before. The biggest asset banks have always had has always been mortgage loans. Not now, it's commercial loans. Not only that, the quality of corporate debt today is the weakest ever. There are only two corporations that have triple A debt today, only two. One of them happens to be Microsoft, by the way. Um, this is a time bomb. This corporate debt level is a time bomb with, to explode. And I noticed the Fed just made an announcement within the last, say, 48 hours. They think they're going to start buying corporate debt now. Are they going to buy everything? Is this corporate socialism? It sure is corporate socialism. Why did they borrow so much money? Why did they buy so much What did they do with it? And here is the sickening part of this whole thing. Here's the egregious part of this whole thing. Talk about corporate mismanagement. They did it for stock buybacks. Last year, corporations bought back $1 trillion worth of their own stock. Now, what happens when they do that is the corporate CEOs, uh, then they, um, they're allowed, they get a big windfall in their stock price, and it allows them to move, bump out of their 99% and move into the 1%. That's how they bump out of their 99 and move into the 1%. You do these corporate buybacks, run your stock up, get a shirt tie, and you sell your stock, you make a lot of money. They get 800 billion of these buybacks in the year 2018. Now, the, the, this is financial engineering. The airlines now said they need 60 billion. Listen, last year of their free cash flow, they put 96% of their free cash flow last year. Instead of saving it for a rainy day, or using it for some kind of infrastructure development, buying back their own stock. 96%. When their stocks were $50, $60, $70, $80 a share, today they're $10, and $20, and $30 a share. They should all be fired across the board, not get $60 million, billion, by the way. Here's what the Harvard Business Review says about stock buybacks. And this is a quote. When companies do these buybacks, they deprive themselves of the liquidity that might help them cope when sales and profits decline in an economic downturn. Duh, duh, they didn't do it. Now they want $60 billion from us, the taxpayers? I'm sorry, full stop on that one, full stop on that one. Full stop on the casinos in Las Vegas getting our money Full stop on that. But if they go bankrupt, one else will start a new one. That's what happens. My fourth item I want to talk about is the deconstruction of the federal administrative state. This is one of Trump's major achievements, other than the tax cut he did for $1.5 trillion in 2017, which was pretty much across the board, but the big influence happened to be corporations. He cut their taxes from 35 to 21%. So they'd have more money to go out and buy back their own stock to enrich more CEOs. So those CEOs then would get over the bump from the 99 and go into the 1% themselves. And the estate tax. The exemption on the estate tax, he doubled. So now if you're a millionaire, before the first $5 million, you didn't have to get a, your tax on for your kids and the people that you inherit your money. He doubled it to 11. So, so the first $11 million now, those are the big beneficiaries. Who does that benefit? Does any of this trickle, trickle down to you and me? Absolutely no. Now, what Trump has done is the following. He gutted the White House pandemic, pandemic response team that was headed by Rear Admiral Timothy Zimmer in 2018, just in time before we have one of the biggest pandemics of all time. It, that should be the last thing. That should be something that they add money to, not that they take money away from, and certainly that they omit. That should never be something that's omitted by any government anywhere, anywhere in the world. It is, it, it, it's, it's, almost, it's almost sinful to do something like that. It's crazy. He also gutted the State Department. He's gutted the EPA. His proposed budget for the new fiscal year cuts one 
trillion dollars in Medicaid and the Affordable Care Act. His new budget has deep cuts, deep cuts in the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control. Now, within the last week, the head of the Office of Management and Budget at the White House was asked about those deep cuts that are in the proposed budget on the CDC, and he doubled down on it and said, yeah, we we're leaving those there. So if this doesn't bring right to people, if there's something wrong here, uh, <laughs> I think there's something really, really wrong here. Last week, a federal judge blocked the Trump administration rule changing proposal. It would take 700,000 people, low-income people, off of SNAP, which is Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program. Is there something wrong there? Yeah, there is. Um, now, finally, I want to talk about the worldwide supply chain, how it's broken. Um, and here, with this virus exposed, as it exposes all these warps out there, this is another big one, because it's exposing the utter failure of America's 30 to 40 year experiment with neoliberal capitalism's globalization effort. And essentially what we've done over the last 30 to 40 years is we have shipped all of our manufacturing to the lowest wage common denominator in the world. That's broken the back of the middle class, it's destroyed our unions, and it's opened a political window for anti-establishment presidential candidates. So now we're paying the price of that downgrade of our manufacturing infrastructure. The supply chain is broken, and it's going to break some companies. And what happened over that cycle is the corporations started what they call just-in-time inventory. But the just-in-time, meaning they didn't really have much inventory in-house. But just-in-time inventory is Long Beach docks. Just-in-time inventory is Long Beach docks from China, from Taiwan, from uh, other Southeast Asian countries. And that has broken, and I think you're going to get a tectonic change there as well. I think America's going to go back to rebuilding its manufacturing infrastructure. That's what I think will happen. Probably under a new administration and a new president. I don't know if the Trump group can survive this. But um, uh, now, and finally, um, I want to talk a little bit about China and what they've done. And this is kind of a glimmer of hope story, I think, because they've actually had some remarkable success in the face of all of this, in the sense that starting in January, as soon as they got sent to this, they locked down Hubei province, that includes the city of Wuhan, where the virus started. Then they also stopped all travel during the Chinese New Year, which was a huge deal in China for everybody. And they effectively stop the rapid spread. I mean, uh, recently they've had zero new cases. And so um, uh, they've actually started lifting quarantines. They're lifting their curfews. People are going back to work in China. Factories are coming back online. For example, Apple and Starbucks are both reopening their stores. 90% of the businesses outside of Mumbai province now are up and running again. So um, they did it right. We haven't done it right, and we still have a long way to go on this. If you go back to my original timeline, I don't think we're going to make that two to four week timeline. So I think it could be very dicey. It's almost like on the edge of a razor here. We've got which way this thing could fall. One final thing that's kind of interesting about these quarantines and curfews. One single person infected, if you don't have quarantines and if you don't have curfews at all, one person can lead to 4,142 total infections within 30 days. That's how rapidly this thing can spread. So there you go, Sam. Those are my words. That was quite, that was quite impressive, uh, uh, Robert. You're at 19 and a half minutes. Uh, I mean, 19 and a half. You were good. I, I, I told this man we were aiming for a, for a 20 minute video. I promised him I was going to sit here and keep my mouth shut. I don't think he thought I could do it, but I did. And I could easily turn this into a three hour uh, question and answer, uh, Robert. But unfortunately for, the, for this kind of series, 
we're not able to do that but that that was quite a mouthful and guys you're simply you're, you're probably like me going to have to listen to this through about about three about three more times to uh, it, 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 it really brought in a, a flood of new viewpoints in 20 minutes that uh, that, that we haven't had a chance to get into. So I, I, anyway, Robert, as much as I would like to ask for amplifications and clarifications, and, and as fascinating as that would be, we're simply going to have to leave it at that. That, that was a very well-worded, and I encourage people to uh, go back and listen to this uh, two or three times. But the bottom line before we sign off is you don't sound super optimistic that we're going to get out of this in the next two to four weeks. And it could go on for quite a bit longer in this country. Seems that way. Yeah. I think so. Okay. And we will all see how that pales out. And I'll have to find some time later in the year to get Robert back on the show so we can spend a full hour uh, breaking this down uh, after we see how this plays out for a couple of months. But Robert, uh, I really appreciate you. You obviously put a lot of work into this and we uh, appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule this week. I know you're as busy as I am. And so, if you folks, if you like what Robert had to say to us, uh, please thumb up this video and please subscribe when you're over here and look forward to more of these videos coming out in the next few days. And Robert Hunziker, keep up the good fight. Great. Nice talking with you, Sam. Keep up the good work. Uh huh. Bye, guys. <laughs>